Welcome to the source of commercial real estate, where we discuss all things non-residential commercial real estate, including finding and funding deals, market intel, finding a competitive advantage, and using real estate to live the life that you want. I am your host, Jonathan Hayek, and today I am talking with Travis Watts with Best Ever and Ashcroft Capital. Travis is a full-time investor, passive income advocate, public speaker, and director of investor education at Ashcroft Capital. He dedicates his time to educating investors who are looking to be hands-off when it comes to real estate investing. Travis was awarded the Linda's Legacy Industry Impact Award in 2022. Travis, congratulations on that award. Thank you for being here. How are you today? I'm doing great, Jonathan. Thrilled to be here. Thanks for making this happen. Travis, I'm sincerely looking forward to this conversation. Um, I really admire your um, your work on Best Ever. Um, I really connect with your philosophy on passive investing. Uh, lifestyle design, time freedom. And so I'm um, really looking forward to having uh, this conversation today. Um, before we get into that, why don't we start by you telling us about your background and what your work in real estate looks like today? Sure. Happy to start with that. So I'm just a guy that that knew nothing about real estate, didn't come from a family of real estate, um, didn't take any courses or have any mentors early on. So I got started the way a lot of people do with single family residential real estate and flipping houses and Airbnb stuff was just kind of becoming the trend and popular. So that was that was my start for about six and a half years. I was fully active. I was very hands on and I was working in the oil and gas industry just because of the pay I could make doing 100 hours a week with <laughs> overtime and bonuses. And I was saving my money like crazy, man. It's like I never left college, just rice and beans and ramen and money in the bank. So I did that up until the point that it started to make sense to consider being a passive income investor, maybe being a passive investor where I'm not actually locating the properties, doing all this work, having to find deals and source them. And maybe I could just let my money start to work for me. So when I ran that math, this was in about 2014, 15, I started really kind of articulating what I what I was doing and what I wanted to achieve with real estate. Turned out I had enough cash flow to support my lifestyle, which meant I could leave the job I didn't like doing and I could start to pursue other avenues that were more important to me, you know? And ultimately what I decided to do is to help others, to kind of give back things I knew, things I'd learned along the way. And so I've been, uh, as you mentioned in the intro, a passive income advocate for people, you know, building a life on your terms, something I call time freedom and passive income can simply free up your time, which can give you so many more choices in life on what you want to do, whether it's retire early or just retire in general, whether it's travel more, whether it's, you know, retire a spouse or spend more time with kids. I mean, endless examples. So uh, from 2015 through current, I've been mostly a full-time limited partner investor. So I'm partnering with my capital, with general partners that are doing the active side of the business, and I'm just letting my money work for me. And then on the active side, I run several podcasts, webinars, I do interviews like these, and I just try to be a, a spokesperson, if you will, for passive income. That's who I really support in this world. And so that's where that's where I'm at. I work with Joe Fairless over at Ashcroft Capital, been a big investor with Joe for a long time. And, um, you know, that's kind of another avenue that I've, I've taken since 2019. Travis, um, I know your story fairly well. Um, I know it can be strange for um, on the podcast host side for audience members to know a lot about your story, but you don't know about your audience members. But um, I listen to all your stuff on Best Ever and um, your YouTube channel, and um, I, I hear you on a lot of other podcasts. I know your story well. Um, you spent you spent some time working in the oil fields. You talk about making a ton of money, uh, but also working a ton. Um, yeah. But you had no time freedom during that time. Correct. L looking back on it, um, was that a choreographed move to get to where you are now? Or were you simply trying to do the right thing in the moment with no vision of where you were going to end up? How do you view that time now? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Very interesting one. It was 100% intentional. I knew I was going to go into a role like that with the hopes of staying on board long enough to, you know, save up some money. Come from a very frugal background. Both my parents, they they split when I was 5, but both of them are independently frugal <laughs> by nature. So that taught me a lot about saving, but it, at some point between reading a few books and, you know, the Kiyosaki books and whatnot, I started to kind of get that bug of, Hey, this makes a lot of sense to be an investor, right? Because you can only save so much money that only gets you so far. And I just realized after crunching some numbers, that's not the way to retirement, you know, money in the bank. So I, I knew I wanted to be an investor. I knew real estate was an avenue I wanted to check out and explore. I also knew I didn't have any money. <laughs> and so, again, I mean, I, I could have approached it differently by maybe taking some courses or, or being a GP or something earlier. But I chose to just go with a depressed real estate market in 2009 and 2010 and start buying up single family at 40, 45 percent off and then fixing them up using a value add strategy and selling them. So it, it was fully something I didn't know the end game by date. I didn't say I'm going to join the oil field and be done in five years. I just joined with the hopes that I would get there. And so when I did, first thing I wanted was my my time back. <laughs> so maybe that's the answer to my next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So 2015, you start as a full time LP. Uh, not many people choose to go that route. Most people would choose to go the GP route because you True. arguably could could have made more money True. if you would say build a portfolio of short term short term rentals or build a huge flipping empire or something like that. Yeah. You chose the passive route. So explain yeah. a little more about why you went totally passive instead of the active side. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, there is, you know, it's higher risk, higher reward, right? You've got some liability and it's a, a whole lot of work and it's a true business to be a general partner. But the, you know, again, your your potential is unlimited, you know, to do that kind of stuff. Where I was at mentally, if you think about it from a psychological standpoint, I had just deprived myself pretty much since I left home at 17 of any luxuries, any real meaningful relationships, any meaningful vacations, it, any and all partying scenes and all this stuff, right? I, I pretty much just squandered my youth with work, 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 go to bed, wake up, work. That's all I did, man. It was a constant grind. And I was so burned out at that point. You know, when 2015 rolled around and I was finally crunching those numbers thinking, I don't have to do this anymore if I don't want to do this. That was a magic moment. So I don't think I would have been in the right state to put in even more effort and more hustle to start learning the GP side of the business and to get rolling with that. I really needed to take a step back, relax for a bit, move on to some, you know, no work for a while and then 40 hour work week again and kind of reintroduce myself to to the world. <laughs> so thankfully, in that time frame, I uh, met my girlfriend, which is now my wife. And, you know, things really started to blossom and develop. And it just gave me uh, that mental peace to start to rebuild on. And then I just started really liking the idea that I could partner with people that had better connections with them than I did, that could find better deals, that could underwrite better, that were just more scalable and efficient. And I thought, you know, yeah, I could try to compete and I could try to learn this myself, but I could also just partner with a bunch of other people and diversify that way. And that's the path I, I decided to go. I asked you a few minutes ago about um, the time in the oil fields and whether that was choreographed and the, the, what I got out of you was that it was very intentional. Yeah. And so what's your advice to others that hear your story and say, wow, a full-time passive investor making six figures as a full-time passive investor. Um, I want that. Um, what, what is your advice to people who really connect with this idea, but are just starting out? Yeah, I would say the, the first thing is it's not for everyone, hands down. I don't necessarily recommend the path that I took. I was a person, you know, struggling, coming from nothing and trying to build something and trying to be as realistic as possible about it, not trying to get rich quick and play the lottery and squander money and gamble and all that. So um, my four steps for anyone who does resonate with kind of what I built was to 
earn as much as you can earn with your highest and best earning potential. And that's different for everyone. It depends on what you went to school for, or if you went to school, what kind of businesses you might be able to create, side hustles you might be able to do, whatever. So that's step number one. Step number two is if you can, and most people can, if you really try and think about it, live on as little of that income as possible for a period of time. I don't subscribe to this live severely below your means till the day you die and clip coupons till you're 80 and all this kind of stuff. Just just keep in mind, it's a short term sacrifice when you look at your total lifespan. For me, that was like, mm, I don't know, six to eight years or something like that. It could be shorter or longer, depending on where you're starting and what your goals are. Number three is to invest and not just save. You've got to invest in something. And this is where you, I'm a, I'm not totally biased towards what I decide to invest in. I'm an advocate of passive income, but that could come from a hundred different types of assets or businesses that produce passive income. For me, that made the biggest difference. It gives you a backstop on your active income. It can allow you to retire or retire early, things like that. Number four is avoid bad debt. And the way that I define that is if the interest rate that you're having to pay is higher than what you could otherwise achieve through conservative investing, I would say, then it's bad debt. So a credit card charging you 25% interest or whatever they charge, you know, is bad debt because reasonably speaking, I'm not going to get a 25% cash flow yield out of a passive investment, right? But on the flip side, if I had had student loans or a car loan or something that was three or 4%, I probably wouldn't decide to pay that off. I would instead make investments that yielded me eight, nine, 10% or something like that and kind of play the arbitrage. So those were my four steps. Again, I went aggressive and hard and the market plays a factor, of course, but that was six to eight years to build up financial independence. And I do want to articulate that really quickly too for people. So if we think about the hierarchy of wealth building, you start from, let's call it self-sufficiency. This is like, okay, I went out and got a job and I've got these bills and I'm paycheck to paycheck. I can survive on my own. I'm self-sufficient. I'm not dependent on anybody else, but I don't have any assets or savings or investments. Stability is the next step. You're more stable if you can pay down some of that bad debt, put an emergency fund in the bank, you got more of a steady job or a career. So now you're more stable. Flexibility is the step above that. Now, flexibility is where you have some investments, maybe some passive income, uh, maybe no bad debt at this point. And so you're more flexible on your lifestyle. You could decide, hey, I'm going to quit this job if I don't like it, or I'm going to try this other career and make a move here, or I'm going to take six months off and go travel. That's flexibility over lifestyle. The next step is financial independence. And I define it as being able to fully support you or your family through your investments, whatever those investments are. I chose a path of passive income to do that. So if I had, for simple math example, 100,000 in passive income and I could live comfortably off 70,000, I'm financially independent at that point. But your number could be different. It may be higher, it may be lower. And above this is financial abundance, and I'll just kind of cap it off there. These are the people who, you know, they, they got, you know, 300 million, they got a billion, they're Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and stuff. They can't spend all their money, and they certainly don't need that kind of income or wealth to survive. So they're in an abundant mindset. They can just go arbitrarily uh, buy companies and, and donate their money and, and do more charitable giving and stuff like that. So that's the full hierarchy. I like to teach people how to get to financial independence if that's your goal. That was great. So much, so much important and valuable information in there. I want to transition into um, one of your big areas of expertise, and that's passive investing. So uh, before we get too far into it, I want to kind of differentiate your role as a passive investor versus your role in Ashcroft Capital mm -hmm. um, versus your, you know, your role on podcasts. So um, tell me, how did you first connect with Ashcroft Capital and Joe Fairless? Yeah, that's a good question. So I grew up in Fort Collins, Colorado, and at a certain point I moved out to Denver when I was getting into oil and gas and stuff like that, more of the real estate. 
I met Joe after one of his first best ever conferences. I don't know if it was the first or the second. It was pretty early on. And it was when I was starting to kind of articulate my criteria for investing, you know, knowing that I like B class product and value add business plans and monthly distributions and these markets and not those. And I had that written down and my, my buddy introduced me, said, you got to meet this guy, Joe. He didn't tell me anything about Joe. I had no idea who Joe Fairless was. So I'm meeting Joe and I start explaining my criteria to him. And I'm like, you know, it'd be cool to be more hands off with it because blah, blah, blah. And he's, he's just sitting back. I mean, Joe's super humble, just taking it all in. And then I realized through our conversation that he was basically doing exactly what I was looking for. Ashcroft Capital buys B-class assets in Sunbelt markets with monthly distributions and value add plans. So I did a deal with them. But at that point, I wasn't wanting to go hard and heavy with any one operator or person because I didn't know what I didn't know. And I was willing to accept that. So I just did one at the time. And then I did a few others with other syndicators. This is when I was selling my single family homes. And then, you know, one led to two and two led to three. And then some family members started investing with me in their deals. And I just really enjoyed their process, their communication, their transparency, the team. They were starting to build the track record. Deals were starting to sell. And I was finally seeing the bigger picture to how syndications work. And so they just became one operator that, you know, I've put the most capital with out there, but they're never going to be with all of my capital. <laughs> so in 2019, to answer your question, Joe had his first uh, born daughter, uh, Quinn. And so I reached out to him over a weekend and, you know, I didn't really have a next move in my life at that point. I just knew I would like to get the word out more to people about investing. I didn't know how to do that or what to do. And I'm like, hey, what if I came on board? Because I go to a lot of these conferences now and these meetups and all this stuff. And, and what if I could somehow partner with you and Ashcroft and I could explain, you know, syndications, who you are, what you do, how it works and coming from an investor perspective, you know, where I could talk to others like a peer. I said, you call me whatever you want to call. I mean, you know, the, the pay structure is not what's important here. I just want to this is my development that I want to move towards. And so they brought me on as a director of investor relations. And so I, I started building that team up so I could move over to director of investor education. And that's what I am today. And that allows me to travel around and do the speaking events I do and the best ever podcast and the webinar series with Ashcroft and workshops and all the rest. There's a lot that I do uh, throughout a course of a year. Very cool. So you kind of made your own job description. You didn't uh, search the uh, search the internet for jobs that were available. You reached out yeah. to someone that you had already connected with and um, and pitched him the job description. Basically, yeah. And I was trying to come from a place of value. I think that's important for everyone to understand, no matter what you do in life or business. Where I was coming from was, look, I know your focus is family right now. You've got a daughter. I know you want to be home. I know you don't want to be out on the road traveling. Well, at the time, I didn't have our son wasn't born yet, you know, so I'm just this, you know, my wife works for an airline. I, I fly for free. Uh, I like to do these events anyway. So it was like this budget frugality mix of, you know, <laughs> what can I do to help you and what do you need right now? And they needed investor relations. You know, Joe at that point was taking 100% of the investor calls. He was doing a lot of the marketing. He was being a general partner and a speaker and an author. And, a, and I'm like, dude, you can't do all this and have time for family. I know that. So anyway, that's, yeah, that's what I came from. So Travis, you describe yourself as a cash flow investor in value add real estate. Um, explain this philosophy a little more and what does cash flow look like in 2023? Yeah. So, you know, though I would say 70% of what I invest in is usually residential cash flowing real estate um, with a value add component so that there's some potential equity upside. I also invest in other asset classes as well, whether it's mobile home parks or self-storage or car washes or ATM machines or publicly traded REITs or whatever they are. You know, I've got a lot of different sources of income. So um, I'm not one to say everyone should do this and not that. 
I'm just an advocate for something that produces positive cash flow. So like I mentioned earlier, that could be a business or any type of investment. You can start with some investments as little as $10, like buying a share of a publicly traded REIT or a dividend paying stock and work yourself up from there. So what does cash flow look like in 2023? Well, since I started investing in multifamily syndications around 2015, it's gotten really popular. There's a lot of training programs. There's a lot of institutional demand, especially in the product type that I invest in. A lot of syndicators coming out of the woodwork from left and right. And, and I think that's a great thing. But the negative thing about it is the pricing is, has skyrocketed. Some deals now are, you know, we're seeing negative leverage in the industry and cash flows come down and overall returns have come down in recent years. So, and now with rates as high as they are, uh, that hurts, especially the last three years worth of deals for sure. So, um, you know, you, you might expect realistically in a deal like what I do anywhere between maybe like a five, six, 7% cash flow, or it used to be more like nine, 10, 11% cash flow years ago. Um, I see a lot of projected returns as far as the IRR to be more like 13 to 15% versus what we saw in the past, which was like 20 to 30% in some cases. So, you know, everyone's got to just adjust to that. We go through market cycles. We go through good and bad times economically. I mean, you got to remember there was a time you could go put your money in the bank and earn 12%, <laughs> you know, but those days are, are gone. Now, they come back a little in the last year, but uh, we've been seeing all time low rates for, for numerous years and you're not making any money in the bank. So you're always having to pivot. It's another reason why I don't like to be a black and white thinker of just, or a one trick pony. This is what I know. This is what I do. And it's all I'll ever do in life. Cause if, if multifamily stops making sense, I've got to pivot. And I've got to know other things besides that to pivot to. So I think that's always important to um, invest mostly in what you know and understand. And maybe that has the most potential at this time. But to diversify for nothing else, I mean, for, you know, besides portfolio preservation, just to learn some new things and have some more options to move into if that's something that makes more sense later. You talked about some deals that you've uh, purchased over the last few years, and you talked about how uh, how returns have changed um, since you started passive investing. What is your level of worry on deals that you've invested in um, in say you know second half of twenty two of twenty twenty through mm. quarter two of twenty twenty two? It was a weird time, super low mm -hmm. rates. Um, some goofy financing was happening. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing some. Uh, we're seeing some rate adjustments now. So, what what is your level of worry specifically on on deals in your portfolio? Yeah, I think that specifically in my portfolio, 2021 and 22 were the rockiest deals overall because we had all time low rates, almost free money to borrow with, and all time high pricing. So that's a scary scenario. And I did speak out about that during those time frames, but I am a dollar cost average type of investor because I learned that lesson a long time ago through the stock market and trying to time it. And I listened to people that were constantly saying that, you know, the bottom's about to fall out. Here we go. And I would wait. And then next year they would say the same thing. And then the year after they'd say the same thing. And then I'm like, wait, three years ticked by and I got a 0% return. So, you know, I made a lot through 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And then maybe some of those deals are going to perform severely under expectations. Maybe even a couple of those are going to be at a loss to an extent. I don't know the final outcome. But today, you're buying at depressed pricing again because of interest rates. So the deals I'm going into right now are being purchased between a 20 to 30% discount relative to pricing 18 months ago. And if the Fed decides to either stagnate rates and leave them high, you're already accounting for that through your underwriting, hopefully getting some fixed rate, long-term debt, stuff like that. If they taper them down, it could be everybody's best case scenario. You might refinance early. You might sell early. Uh, there's a lot of options that could happen there. So I think we're in a much healthier market today if you're deciding right now to make an investment this year. That being said, it's not risk-free by any means. We still don't know about this 
looming recession and whether or not it's going to happen and what's going to happen with unemployment and what's going to happen with rents as they're kind of stagnating right now after these all-time high lifts through um, 21 and 22. So um, dollar cost, man. I mean, you know, so out of my 50 plus deals that I have as an LP, I would say seven of them have stopped distributions temporarily. Uh, I've yet to have a capital call. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but a lot of people were using floating rate debt and short-term bridge loans in the last few years. And, you know, I've never been a fan of that kind of debt structuring because you never know what's going to happen. And just like back in, what was it, 2018, I think, maybe 2019, the Fed then said, we're going to start to raise rates. And when they did, the market got really shaky and they backed off and then they went all the way back down again. So I think a lot of people didn't believe the Fed and they thought, yeah, 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 you're going to raise rates. You know, we'll see your quarter point hike. And then all of a sudden, you know, the Fed funds is up at 5% and it caught a lot of people off guard. So the only thing I've ever found to, um, you know, long term survive all these economic cycles is just to diversify. So I've got money a lot of places. And those deals I just mentioned are just my syndication holdings, but there's a lot of other passive income I have and then active income too. So there's no foolproof plan, but work with good operators, um, you know, research your markets and you know, some mistakes I made a long time ago were going too heavy on a deal that I thought was going to be amazing and it just didn't work out. You know, so I had too much in one place. So you've been in over 50 deals as an LP. Um, I've no doubt you talked to a ton of operators. So here we are in mid 2023. What is setting apart excellent operators right now in 2023, whether they're, whether they're having great success, um, or they're getting great deals or they're just, uh, or they're just good to work with? What what makes an excellent operator in 2023? I think a lot of people are looking at and asking about track record. They're asking about, you know, have you done capital calls? Have you had deals gone south? That hasn't really changed necessarily, but that's more of a focus. Um, what kind of debt are you putting on these properties? They're looking for a little more sophistication and conservative underwriting, lower leverage, is setting a lot of operators apart saying, yeah, maybe the cash flow will be a little lower, but we're going to put, you know, 35% down on this property. Some people were leveraging as high as 80, 85% in the last couple of years, which is crazy. And we've seen some foreclosures happen because of it. So uh, the other thing, uh, what else sets an operator apart? Uh, track record expertise, hyper specializing in a particular niche, uh, communication, transparency, I mean, there's a lot of things really that that you could look for, but I think another one to mention, a notable mention here is, are you are you able to actually get deal flow right now? Because a lot of sellers are not wanting to sell if their debt isn't coming due, because a lot of people are of the belief that rates will taper back down over the next couple of years. So if you don't have to take a 25% discount today on a property, then why do it? you know, unless you have a reason that you, you, you need to, to do that. So, um, and you know, the ability to find deals, what I mean by that more specifically is do, do these operators you're working with have uh, broker relationships, seller relationships, you know, a, a deal pipeline, because a lot of operators that I've, you know, I've been on their list for years, they've just dried up. I've seen like one deal a year coming from them, something like that. So um, investors like to, keep their money working for them. So that money is going to be allocated towards other operators. If an operator is listening to this and they want to get the attention of Travis Watts or someone like you, um, someone who is educated and um, you know very active as an LP, um, how does an operator get your attention? It's got to be hard. Um, so if someone wants to pitch you or someone like you a deal, what strategies can you recommend? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm always open to looking at anybody's deal for any reason. I help a lot of people out with kind of their first overviews and, you know, how they're going to pitch that to potential investors, things like that. So feel free to take me up on that offer if you're in a position like that. Otherwise, here's what I would say. Remember that there are very experienced operators that exist today 
that have track records and have best in class operations. Okay. So if you're going to present a deal to the market and raise capital, what is going to set you aside from them? Why wouldn't I just go invest in another Ashcroft deal? You're, you're going to have to have either lower fees, for example, uh, higher cash flow, some sort of you know special structure that you specialize in. Um, for me, it might be a diversification piece. I'm always interested in learning more about things like that. So something other than multifamily, but uh, you, you just have to remember you're competing with the big dogs. So if you're going to offer me the same terms Ashcroft does, why would I do your deal? I don't know you <laughs> and you don't have a track record. Travis, what do you think of some operators starting to offer a straight debt option, oftentimes in the 10% range? Um, what, do you, what do you make of this? I've done a handful of them over the years before this was becoming such a popular strategy. And I think, it, it, well, it's the result of many things, but Primarily, when we were talking in the beginning of this podcast, and I was saying that you know cash flow in 2023 has come down pretty significantly to what it was just five, six, seven years ago. So some investors are needing or wanting that higher yield, you know, especially retirees or people looking for alternatives to fixed income instruments. You know, maybe the four percent isn't going to do it for them, so they're going to look for something at eight, nine, or ten percent. But then they're going to be willing to sacrifice that upside potential on the deal. And I'll be honest; like I do it for that reason because I created the eight percent rule years ago. For me, I live on an average of an eight percent yield. It's probably a little higher than that, but that's my goal is to target that. So what that means is, if I go do a deal today that's four percent cash flow. I now need to go do like a 10% deal so that I can average that out and get close to that eight and keep that kind of allocation. So that's how I use them. Um, I'm a fan of them in general, but I've also seen a lot of these equity deals that I've done come full cycle with you know double digit solid returns. So I don't want to put everything there and just you know have a eight to ten percent return. I, I yeah, I wanna I wanna ask a follow-up to that. My concern, I'm similar to you. I'm a cash flow investor. And when I see some deals offering four or 5% returns in year one, I have a really hard time with that. Yeah. But the the 10% debt option is attractive, except for the fact that the deal itself is not returning 10% in year one. And so then my question is, well, where's my return coming from? If the deal itself isn't returning 10%, the deal is returning four or 5%. So where's my return coming from? Mm -hmm. And so then it seems like I'm being paid. It seems like the operator is over raising in order to pay some investor returns in year one um, until cash flow can get can get increased. And so that concerns me when the deal itself isn't returning the 10%, yeah. but it's, you know, it's coming from other investors. D did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. We can talk about a few different structures that I've seen and done. Um, so you've got some groups that say they're doing a, a standard syndication value add multifamily deal. They'll have two share classes, A and B, for example. So the A will pay you 9% with really no upside, and the B pays you 4 or 5%. But what's happening is usually, what, what I've seen anyway, they're buying a property that maybe is cash flowing 65 to 7% year one in reality, and they're only paying the people in the A's like 20% of the total capital raise, and all the rest is getting like a 4%. So in that case... 100% of those investor returns really is coming from the property and really is being generated there. Now, that's a that's a, a deal that I would look at. Other deals are to your point, they're going to they're going to basically pre-raise money potentially and then pay out a distribution that's really not there in hopes they can catch that up later. I don't like that kind of play. The debt funds that I do uh, whether they're private or public, what they're doing is they're essentially a hard money lender saying, hey, we'll give you this bridge loan at 13% for your little project. And then they're going to clip a 2% fee off of that and give the rest to their investor base. So again, they really are generating a 13% return. You may be getting 10 or nine or whatever it is, but it's still fully being generated there. One more example, 
is in, and I'm not a big fan of the stock market, but I have a brokerage. And so I've done some ETFs, some exchange traded funds that'll track an index like the S&P, for example, and they sell covered calls every month. And those covered call options generate cash flow. And 100% of that cash flow comes to the investors on a monthly distribution. Some of those yields are still currently and have been in the past 10, 11, sometimes 12%. So um, I don't like a deal that I'm getting paid out of money that's not there, to your point. But there's several other options to look at. Okay, great. Thanks for thanks for differentiating that. Um, I want to go into kind of your philosophy on um, education and your online presence. You're very active on podcasts, on YouTube, um, workshops, and webinars. Can you describe your philosophy when it comes to your online presence and education? What What are you trying to do? Yeah, so this is what changed in my life and was very, very impactful. I joined, uh, this was back in, oh gosh, probably 2014, I would guess. I joined this uh, investment club in Colorado that had all accredited investors in it. Pretty large group, 100 plus at that point. Now it's probably 500 plus in size. And the guy who was facilitating it, him and, and one of his buddies in the group, they had been full-time LP investors for 20 plus years, a lot in real estate. And before all these programs, before it was like the popular thing to do, they had been doing this full-time. Now these guys had way more wealth than me. I mean, their net worth is probably 100 mil plus a piece. I mean, these are very wealthy guys. And this was primarily what they chose to invest in for their lifetime. And they really opened up to me like a mentor for free. And they started explaining this to me because that was kind of the logical next step I wanted to take. And those were my idols. You know, those were the people. But, but the thing I thought was, how come you guys don't have any kind of public presence, you know, and a lot of LPs want to remain anonymous and behind the scenes. And, and I get that, you know, I mean, if you're uber wealthy, you don't necessarily want to go around flaunting that. <laughs> but um, I thought, you know, that is such an underserved part of that market. You know, there, there was like two or three that I could think of back then that I could, could find online that were passive income investors, you know, that were full time. So not everyone needs or wants to be a full-time passive investor, but my mission, my philosophy to answer your question is just to help people expand their knowledge around the idea of passive income investing. So many of us, myself included, are taught it's buy low and sell high. You put your money in a stock, you, you hopefully that stock goes up. If it does, you sell it, right? You fund your IRA in your 20s, 30s, 40s when you're 60 you got some money in there. It's buy low, sell high. It's always that. It's the fix and flip. It's the crypto is going to explode and go up. I mean, this is all you hear about, but it doesn't have to be that way. And there's a big difference between equity investing and cash flow investing. And what I've seen in my own life, the changes, the benefits I've seen from what passive income can really do for you and your lifestyle, if, if you really commit to it, it's extraordinary. It's like nothing else to to actually be able to free up, frankly, your your most precious resource, which is your time. You know, you can't get your time back. You can always make more money. And the last thing I'd say to all of this is uh, the big difference between rich and wealthy. I've never envied being rich. That's never that was never my goal. Uh, rich is all about income. Okay, you're a celebrity and you make whatever, $50 million a year. You're you're rich. You're a professional athlete, you get paid millions, you're rich, right? But how many people can we think of that were lottery winners and celebrities and professional athletes that lost all their money? They went bankrupt, they blew it, right? So you're rich today, maybe gone tomorrow. But wealth is about assets, it's about passive income, it's about sustainable assets or income that can provide you uh, for the rest of your life without needing a job. And to me, that's so powerful. I think when, when, when you really understand that fundamentally, that's a, that's a game changer. At least it was for me. Uh, your philosophy, and this is probably why you work with Joe Fairless is, is very similar to Joe's. Um, Joe is, he's subtle. Um, he's not an in your face kind of guy, invest with me, invest with me kind of guy. Yeah. Um, he's humble, he's subtle. And that's what I see from you as well. And there's 
plenty of not so subtle stuff on the internet. You know, if you, you can browse yeah. LinkedIn and listen to podcasts and, yeah. you know, I, I listen to, I've listened to best ever for several, several years. And I don't know if I've ever heard Joe pump one of his own deals before and, and tried to get, you know, listeners to, to invest with him, um, mm -hmm. directly through his podcast. Right. And, um, I, I personally admire that. I, I admire humility and, and subtleness. Um, I'm wondering if, if, and you can only speak, speak for you, but do you feel like you're missing out on opportunities or investors by being more subtle and more diplomatic versus, um, you know, the alternative of, of almost everyone else on the internet trying to raise money? I do. I think, Honestly, if if we changed our approach or strategy to to be more of that, you're going to get probably more investors. But you got to think about your branding. You got to think about your values. You have to think about who you want to be and be remembered as. And as much as a lot of the people that push really, really hard at the end of the day, I mean, they're the used car salesmen that people try to avoid. <laughs> I mean, it, it works on a psychological level to an extent, but I think Joe and I are more of a mindset that we're going to play the long game. And if you just take care of your investors legitimately, if you not only do what you say you're going to do, but a little more, that's really what's going to resonate for returning investors. And in this business, returning investors is a powerful thing. You know, with Ashcroft is probably as high as 65% of the capital they're raising is returning investors. So if they're raising $100 million a year, think about that. They're, they're, they're raising maybe $65 million on autopilot without having to be in your face, without having to be a jerk, without having to be outlandish. Not saying everybody is that takes that approach. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's a lot about how Joe wants to, you know, present himself. And for me, it's uh it's the same. Travis, this has been awesome. We're getting towards the end of our conversation here. Um, but I've got a few more questions here that I want to throw at you. They're designed to be fast answered more quickly, but feel free to spend as much time um, as you want on them if you've got a good story. Um, so first, tell me about your best deal. Ooh. Best deal I did, I'll, I'll use the syndication route. Uh, I went into a deal in Phoenix. So this was not an Ashcroft deal. Uh, this was probably the third deal I ever did as an LP. And it was like, going to be a five-year hold with like a, I don't know, 18% IRR or something like that. Well, they exited in like 18 months at almost a 40% IRR. So it was just an incredible turnaround. And it really expedited my thought process and my my whole bias towards why I wanted to do this in the first place. So that was pretty, pretty killer. Tell me about your worst ever deal. Worst ever deal in the syndication space was a sub market of Atlanta with an operator. I didn't do a good job vetting. I just kind of took their word for a lot of things when they said, oh, we've got, you know, 20 years experience. What they were referring to is single family experience. <laughs> and this was like their second syndication deal. And they bought a huge property. It was actually two properties in a portfolio. And they got in over their heads so fast. They hired the wrong property management group. They couldn't renovate to the scope they, they hoped for. Their underwriting was bad. Their communication was terrible. So, you know, that was the same type of underwriting. It was like a five-year play with almost a 20% IRR. But that ended up probably being a, uh, I want to say maybe a 9% return. And we were out in about two years. Thankfully, the market saved us. Atlanta has been a, a, a badass market for years. But man, if that market hadn't bailed us out, we probably would have lost money on the deal. So that taught me a lot about vetting operators. Travis, what's your top tip for finding deals or finding deal operators right now? Um, I'm a big fan of in-person. I think you can tell a lot about people through meeting them. So whether it's a Zoom call like we're doing here or whether it's uh, you know a conference, I would, I would just go meet people. And um, just listen to what they do and get to know who's who. And what you'll find 
is if you attend enough events, you start seeing the same people, the same names, you know, you start connecting the dots. It's like, oh, you're on that podcast and, and you're with that group. And it, it becomes a pretty small world, but it does take some upfront time. So I would spend uh, before you decide to just jump the gun and go wire someone 100K, uh, you know, take the next few months at least to start researching who people are, get on people's deal lists and have some calls. What's your top tip or suggestion for people trying to raise capital? Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. I've never actually raised capital, like in the sense of like my job is to raise capital or I'm dependent to raise capital. <laughs> um, top tip is I, I would say, I don't know if this is the right answer, but for me, it's to get your brand and your story and you out there to people so that people can start to feel familiar and comfortable with you as a human being. So whether you do that through whatever social platform or through a blog or through bigger pockets or on YouTube or on your website, you've got to have a place for people to go who are interested in learning more about you. And um, I just can't think of a person that doesn't have any exposure at all that I've ever invested with. So you, you need to have a presence. Do you have a favorite resource that's been helpful to you, either a podcast, a YouTube channel, a book that people should check out? Ooh, that's a good one. Well, of course, shamelessly to plug best ever, but uh, I, I'm not even saying my show on best ever or Joe specifically, but just what I like about that platform, they bring in a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different types of people in this industry. And so you can, it's not just so focused on one specific thing or one niche. So uh, if you look at their blogs and articles, they're written by a lot of different sources too. They don't just have one or two writers. So I like to find platforms like that, whether it's them or a, early on, I was into bigger pockets for the same reason, because it wasn't necessarily at that point about one brand or one thing. It was a bunch of different people saying a bunch of different stuff. And so you could find the people that you resonated with more and start to kind of follow their journey through a different outlet. So that's what I try to seek is I'm always listening to 10 people's advice on a topic and finding that commonality and saying, you know, I think these people have it right. And I'm going to listen to those three. <laughs> Travis, this has been awesome. I sincerely appreciate your time today, sharing your wisdom, your expertise, um, your valuable time. If, if listeners want to connect with you, learn more about you, ask you questions, where would you like to send them? I put a bunch of links and resources on ashcroftcapital.com forward slash Travis. So my calendar is on there, some downloadable stuff's on there. If you want to follow on, on social, um, it's at Passive Investor Tips on Instagram and Facebook or Travis Watts on LinkedIn and you know, bigger pockets and other platforms. So what, you know, you, you do, you choose the platform that makes the most sense, but I'm, I'm happy to connect with anybody active, passive, uh, accredited, non-accredited Ashcroft or not. Just, um, I just want to be a resource for people. So appreciate it. Perfect. Yep. Travis is very accessible. All of those links will be in the show notes. They are in the show notes right now. Um, Travis, I sincerely appreciate you taking the time out today. This has been a, an enlightening and, um, insightful conversation for me. Listeners, um, I appreciate you. If you'd like to connect with either one of us, feel free to reach out. We would love to talk with you. Until next time, take care.